Can we just give it another moment, a few more people join. Okay, great. All right, so hello to everybody who's joined us. We're just going to wait another moment or two um, and let a few people, uh, a few more people join the Zoom webinar here. So we're quite punctual. We'll just get started in another moment. All right, so um, you're all very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We're delighted to be able to bring you this event to mark the winter solstice. My name is Onya Flood. I'm the Education and Public Engagement Manager with ILOFAR here in Burr in County Offaly. Um, and I'm sure you've all noticed we have an Irish Sign Language interpreter with us, Michael Feeney. So Michael will be with us uh, helping out for the whole event. So thanks very much for joining us. And um, for this event, we will start with a talk with Professor Tom Ray, and then we will open it up to questions from all our participants. So we would really welcome your participation and any questions you'd like to ask. If you're joining us on the Zoom webinar, we've got a Q&A box just down the bottom of the screen. You should see a Q&A icon. You can open that up and type your questions in at any point. And then after the talk, we will um, get to the questions and put them to Tom. If you're joining us on our YouTube live stream, Hello, and please do feel free to type any questions you have into the comment section and they will be passed on as well. So hopefully everybody can get a chance to join in. So um, yeah, I guess I'd like to introduce our speaker. So we have Professor Tom Ray. Tom is a senior professor of astronomy and astrophysics at DIAS, the Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies. Uh, his main research area is on star and planet formation, um, but he's also involved in many other areas, which I cannot list all of. Um, but I will name just a few to give you a bit of an idea on Tom's expertise. So he works with NASA on the James Webb Space Telescope, which will be launching next year, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes, great. And also uh, Tom is a co-principal investigator for Ariel, which is a ESA mission with the European Space Agency, uh, looking at exoplanets. Uh, he's also Ireland's representative on the ESO Council, it's the European Southern Observatory based in Chile. And he's also done a lot of work on Newgrange and related topics. So Tom is going to talk to us today about time from Newgrange through many other areas right up to the modern day and how we tell time and how that has changed. So uh, yeah, I guess we'll get started straight away. So you can take it away, Tom. Great. Thank you very much, Anya. And uh, good evening to everybody. So uh, what I'm going to do, let me just share my screen. I can. Yep, I think that should be okay now, right? Hopefully. All right. So I'm going to talk about the different time machines that uh, mankind has used from thousands and thousands of years ago up to the present day. And before I do that, what I want to do is kind of set the scene from an astronomical point of view. So I'm going to um, just let you in on a couple of astronomical concepts. I mean, some of you may be familiar with these, but uh, indulge me for a few minutes. So the first thing that uh, I suppose people would have noticed is of course uh, the motion of the moon and the sun and the stars. So the moon, of course, you know, it goes through these different phases through full moon here to uh, first quarter and last quarter. Um, 
and then goes to new moon where it's the moon is actually between the sun and ourselves. So that's something that, you know, from ancient times we would have followed. And of course, that gives rise to the word uh, month as well, moon. Okay, so that's that's a basic concept of time in the sky. Now, I just want to mention a few others before we kind of launch into talking about sites like Newgrange. Um, so here is an example of uh, some stonework. This stonework up here actually dates from about 30,000 years ago. This was sort of pitted in stone. And the archaeologists believe that this is actually uh, a representation of, um, of the moon and the cycles of the moon as recorded by people all those thousands of years ago. And here is actually um, uh, down here, you'll see a stone from, uh, from Newgrange and it's called a sundial stone. And uh, one theory is that the, um, the little hole here actually had a sort of stick and the stick recorded the uh, motion of the sun across the sky, the shadow rather like a sundial. Now, whether that's true or not, we simply don't know. I mean, we don't have the equivalent of uh, translations like the hieroglyphics from ancient Egypt into uh, present day languages. So we don't have the equivalent for ancient sites like Newgrange. Um, you know, so there's a bit like the ink blot test. People look at something like that and see, see various things, of course. But the other concept I just want to familiarize with, uh, you with is the idea, of course, that the Earth is going around the sun. The Earth is tilted. Currently, it's tilted at 23 and a half degrees with respect uh, to its orbital motion around the sun. And that, of course, gives rise to the seasons. So when it's in the position here or here, you have September or March position, then the days equal, you have equal days and nights. At the opposite extreme, we have uh, here the winter solstice when no the Northern Hemisphere, including Ireland, is kind of turned away from the sun. And here, when the Northern Hemisphere is turned towards the sun, you have the summer solstice. So we, tonight, we are in this position here. Now, surprisingly enough, by the way, uh, we go around the sun, it's about 100, we're about 150 million kilometers away, but actually, Believe it or not, and I suspect you won't, we are slightly closer to the sun in January than we are in uh, June and July. So, you know, the Australians get a slightly better summer than we do. Anyway, okay. So that's the concept of the, the tilting of the earth. Now this gives rise in the sky to a very interesting phenomenon. The first thing, I mean, this is actually a recording, this picture here on the right, taken in uh, Athens. This is uh, uh, the, the Acropolis near Athens. And what, what you see here is basically the camera opened up at the same time, local noon, uh, every day for the best part of the year when the sky was clear. And this is actually the motion of the sun on the sky during, that, during the year. Here is the summer solstice when the, sky, when the sun is highest in the sky. And here is the winter solstice when the, the sun is lowest down. And you'll also notice there that it isn't quite in a straight line. It goes back and forth. And some of you who've ever seen a, a, um, a sundial will know it has a thing on it called the equation of time. And actually that's what this loop here represents. Anyway, so as I say, it's the tilting of the earth that gives rise to the sun being higher or lower. So that's, those are the sort of the basic facts to keep in mind. So let's start because it's a very appropriate day to start with, uh, with Newgrange. So this picture on the top here is Newgrange. And the picture was taken in the very early um, 60s or late 50s. It was, it was before the excavations of Newgrange were completed by uh, Michael uh, Kelly from uh, Cork. 
And after the excavations were done, he realized above the entrance here, this is the entrance, this is a famous stone called K1, that above the entrance, there was a, an actual roof box. So this was extremely unusual. There's only one other site in Scotland, which has this um, roof box above the entrance. Um, he, he heard a local legend that the sun came into the chamber at a certain time of year. And in fact, this time back in the 60s, one, uh, one night just before the solstice, he camped inside and waited for the sun to rise and saw the solstice phenomena in Newgrange probably for the first time in uh, at least maybe a thousand years or so since this has been covered up. This is a picture of the mound itself. I rather like this one. This is some um, Air Corps um, uh, planes flying in formation above Newgrange. And there's the entrance here, but it gives you an idea of the size of the mound, which is about 80 meters across. So what happens? Well, you know, Around the time of the solstice, and if you'd have looked at the live stream yesterday, unfortunately this morning, of course, there was a lot of cloud, but the light comes in through the roof box, goes along this passage, which is about 18 meters long, and then um, touches just back here in the main chamber. So this is the region of the main chamber with the three alcoves. But what, uh, they would have seen 5,100 years ago when Newgrange was built would have been very, very different. And the reason is this, the tilt of the earth now, as I said, is 23 and a half degrees. Back then it was 24. So we, we can measure all these motions. It was 24 degrees. Now, what does that mean? It means that the shortest day of the year was that bit shorter. The sun would have rose actually a little bit further south and set a little bit further south, but also the longest day of the year would have been that little bit longer. So that means Newgrange would have actually captured the sunlight right at sunrise. Whereas today, well, as I said this morning, you would have seen it, and they were yesterday, you would have had to wait about 11 minutes after sunrise before um, any light came in. So what they saw back then was exactly at sunrise and because of that the light currently if you look at the live stream doesn't quite reach the back wall but in fact it would have just touched the back wall because if you ever go into New Grange you realize there's a rising floor meeting the roof box so it was totally uh, different back then eventually after about 40,000 years by the way it'll realign itself again so we won't be around to see that unfortunately but um, the other interesting thing about it is the roof box, the gap on the roof box as seen from the main chamber exactly matches the width and the height of the sun. So it actually frames the sun. So these were all sort of, this is a very uh, deliberate combination. And we know clearly that the intention was to capture sunrise on the sh shortest day of the year. Of course, we can use astronomy uh, to fix events in history. Uh, eclipses is when the moon goes in front of the sun, for example. We can work when eclipses occurred in the past. And there was, for example, an ancient uh, battle in uh, Persia. And using the fact that there was a record at the time of uh, an eclipse occurring during the battle, we can actually fix to the day when the battle occurred. So that can fix um, the date for historians, for example. So astronomy can be very useful like that. The one thing you should never, however, do, as this man here on the left called Norman Lockyer, he's the, actually started the journal, famous journal Nature that some of you may have heard of, but he, uh, took the opposite approach, the kind of cart before the horse approach, which was to date 
Egyptian temples using their astronomical alignments. And of course, understandably upset a lot of the Egyptianologists. You, so with a site like Newgrange, what you gotta do, or, or the pyramids or whatever, is you use the carbon 14 date, the actual date from which it was constructed to work back to events when it was constructed. And the astronomical events are somewhat different. Now, moving on a bit, this is a, a sundial. Some of you may be familiar with, some may not. But sundials, of course, were used in medieval times and from Roman times as a sort of timepiece. This is actually a four-face wall dial, and it's in uh, St. James's Gate in Dublin. It was recently, uh, 20 years ago, I suppose, were relatively recently restored, but it was actually built up near St. James's Gate around 1790. And, uh, and there was a fountain at the bottom, um, uh, just as I say, just outside St. James's Gate. So the next time you're near there, near the Guinness uh, Brewery, have a look for this, uh, for this sundial. One thing, just one of these weird little facts that you might be interested in is of course, if you look at a sundial, the shadow, right, uh, goes around as we look at it, it goes around clockwise, right? But of course, if you were in Australia, the shadow would go the other way around. So your watch for, uh, is in fact a sort of Northern Hemisphere chauvinism because it's, it's actually, uh, it's the direction of motion refers back to sundials. That's why uh, clockwise is the direction that it is. It's purely an ordinary hemisphere thing. Of course, we can watch the motions of the stars and ancient peoples looked at the stars, saw that they went around. This is a time-lapse photograph and they go around roughly um, uh, the North Star, which is actually up here, it does move around a bit. But the point is, is this, that um, you can tell your latitude, how, how high you are on the Earth, whether you're up near the North Pole or near the equator, from the height of the North Star. So it's a way of telling um, direction. And the other way of telling place is to use time. And this is uh, a the Royal Greenwich Observatory and the Greenwich Meridian is there. And you can, you can stand on top of the Greenwich Meridian, which are a leg in one hemisphere, the Western hemisphere, and your other leg in the Eastern hemisphere. And the Greenwich Meridian defines time for the rest of the, of the world. And this man, George Harrison, came up with a very, very accurate clock that people could bring to see. And as long as you had Greenwich time, you could then find out the second thing you needed, which was your, um, your longitude. So you had latitude from say the North Pole star, and you had your longitude from your difference with Greenwich time. And that was a means of finding out exactly where you were on the earth. And Harrison won a prize from the British Admiralty for his clock. Uh, but it took him many, many years to get the money out of them. And Dunsink Observatory, uh, which some of you are familiar with, is also a place that had time measurements. This is the meridian room in Dunsink Observatory where the stars were observed, and this meridian means north-south, and so the stars were observed going over the north-south line, and you could tell the time using this. And in fact, they then from Dunsink sent a telegraph signal to this is the ballast office where a time ball, which is just located here, was dropped. And the time ball then would set the chronometers on the ships in, in, uh, in the Liffey before they departed for different parts of the world. But it was really the railway that brought a common time across Britain and Ireland, because before that, we actually had Dublin time, and Dublin time differed from London time, and Galway time differed even from Dublin time. If you go 
for example, to, Gal to Galway, this is actually William Street, which is uh, down near the end of uh, Shop Street towards Air Square. You'll see, um, I think it used to be the Cladering House, but there's a, a clock there and there's a blow up of it and you'll see Dublin time. So that was, of course, in Galway. And in case there was any uncertainty amongst the locals, it was actually Dublin time that was being shown there. It was only around 1916 that legally there was one time for Britain and Ireland. And this person I thought was fascinating, Ruth Belleville, she was the Greenwich time lady. She actually got time from the Greenwich Observatory in London fixed her watch and then brought it round to the jewellers of, uh, of London so uh, they could set their clocks and watches. So you literally bought time from, from Ruth. But the real modern uh, time clock is, of course, the atomic clock. And the atomic clock is extremely, extremely accurate. These are the old ones, which are very large, but We've now reduced them to something which is just a few centimetres across. And in fact, the fact that we've been able to reduce them in size means that we put them up in GPS satellites, which give you your position on there. So when next time you're using your phone and trying to find out exactly where you are with Google Maps or whatever, remember that it's satellites in space that have atomic clocks in them, which is actually setting your position because obviously from the different satellites there's a different little delay and that actually can tell you where you are on the earth. And the clocks, the atomic clocks are so accurate now that in fact we can tell um, that the earth isn't rotating quite uniformly. It slows down sometimes, it speeds up a little bit largely due to the movement of the solar, uh, sorry, the, the polar ice caps, but also it's basically the tides and so forth. So it's not very predictable. And that is the reason why occasionally at the end of the year, we add in the leap second. So we actually work with atomic time, but occasionally we realize the air doesn't quite fit and so we have to add an extra second or so. But in the past number of years, we've realized it's an extremely accurate timepiece, even better than atomic clocks up in the sky. So this is the Crab Nebula. By the way, Lord Ross, who uh, uh, saw the Crab Nebula with the telescope in Burr Castle, named it the Crab Nebula. But it's actually the leftover from an explosion in 1054. And its center is a pulsar. Now a pulsar basically um, is the remnants of a very massive star that exploded. The center of it is actually made up of neutrons. Um, it's extremely dense. And it's only something like 15, 20 kilometers across. So it's smaller than, for example, Dublin. All right. But the mass is equivalent to the mass of the sun. So it is extremely massive, extremely dense, but co condensed into something about 15 kilometers across. But the amazing thing about it as well is that it spins very rapidly. Now this one, the crab, um, rotates, spins 30 times or so a second. And in fact, it was discovered by an Irish woman, um, Jocelyn Bell, pictured here. But it's also something that using the telescope in Burr, low far, that we can actually observe these pulsars all over the sky and time them with very, very high precision. But back in 1982, there was a very strange pulsar found. And these were the first millisecond pulsars. So a pulsar basically sends us a pulse. We happen to be in its line of sight. And these pulses are received as radio waves. Sometimes you can even see them optically. But these pulsar pulses are very, very precise. 
they're more accurate than the standard atomic clock, and we can use a collection of, of them together. In fact, they may actually constitute, if you like, a GPS system for our galaxy, right? When you think about, about it, GPSs work by satellites in the sky above the Earth, and they tell us where we are. These all pulsars, millisecond pulsars, all have their unique signature. We can tell how far we are away from them by uh, our motion with respect to them. So it's just like the GPS satellite system. So it may be the case that time, the definition of time may revert back to astronomy. This is something which is uh, currently uh, being debated. So just to, uh, just to conclude, time has always been measured by the sun, the moon and the stars. Um, over time, of course, our measurement systems have got better and better. We are now accurate to one part in 10 to the 14. That means one part of 10 with 14 zeros after it. That's how precise our um, time systems are. And millisecond pulsars may yet be the GPS clocks of the galaxies. So even, you know, maybe sometime in the future when we boldly go forward, we can use the GPS system of these millisecond pulsars to tell exactly where we are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. That was wonderful. Um, if you just stop sharing your screen there, sure, yeah, we'll do. and then we can we can see everybody again. Wonderful. So, hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Tom. We do have some questions coming in, which is great. Uh, some people want to know a bit more about some of the topics you touched on. Um, the first that I'm going to pass on here is about the different time zones, I suppose, for want of a better word. So about the Dublin time and Galway time, and were there other uh, times across the country, and why did we stop observing those? Okay, yes, so there were, uh, there was certainly uh, Dublin time, Cork time, and uh, Galway time. Um, so, I mean, between Dublin and Galway, it's about 15 minutes. So if you notice, for example, um, sunset, will occur, I mean, 15 minutes later in Galway mm -hmm. compared to Dublin. And this, yeah. this, is, this is the basis of the whole thing. So Dublin time is like 28 minutes behind London time. And yes, there were a lot of quirky things. Like for example, in Oxford, if you go to Oxford, all lectures start five minutes late. You know, so in other words, if a lecture was to occur at two o'clock, it'd be five minutes past two. And the local explanation is, well, the reason is that we adhere to Oxford time, because there was actually an Oxford time way back in the sort of um, early, uh, early 19th century. But it was really the railways then that made us enforce one time zone. Okay, and I suppose that's just from a very practical perspective. It was just from a practical perspective. If you're yeah. traveling by train, for example, or communicating with somebody, you get very confused if you're working on a 28 minute time difference. Yes, and that you had to turn your watch back or forward or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that exactly. makes sense, I suppose. So I suppose that's the main reason why we don't use these small time zones anymore, really. That's right. Yeah. I mean, we normally have one hour time division. So, you know, mm -hmm. you go over to uh, you go to Paris now, it's one hour uh, later than us. So it's now sort of eight o'clock or so in Paris. Right. But some places use half hour divisions as well. Yeah, that can get tricky. That, can't that can off. get tricky. Yeah. I remember landing in Darwin in Northern Australia and looking at the airport clock and thinking, there's something gone wrong with my uh, watch or whatever, you know, because <laughs> of the half hour difference. And in fact, they do use half hour time differences. Yeah, very good. Um, brilliant. So, yeah, if anybody has questions, do feel free to continue popping them in there. I see somebody has their hand raised. If possible, if you have a question or a query, you can pop it into the Q&A box. That would be the best way to get it. 
Um, but I'm going to pass on some more questions. So we have one actually from one of our YouTube viewers, and they're wondering if you can provide the literature reference for the three for the thirty thousand year old pitted stone um, that may be a representation of the moon's phases. All right. Yeah. So um, back to the start of the talk. Okay, I can do that now. I don't have it immediately to, to hand, I'm afraid. Um, we can pass it on. They've provided their email address, so we can pass oh, it on. Oh, okay. Well, then that's the easiest thing to do because, yeah, I mean, it, it, um, it's, um, yeah, I mean, there, there's depictions of time in uh, a lot of very ancient sites. And, uh, but as I said, we have to be very careful when you look at something like uh, those stones we tend to interpret them a certain way. And, you know, I mean, one classic example, by the way, which I, I, th I think is really, really good. If you look at K1, which was that stone on the front of, uh, can, I, can I share my screen with you, just show you that K1 again, because I think sure, it's yeah. a really nice uh, point. Um, okay, so let me do that. Sorry, what is And let me go back to this picture of K1 there. Okay. So this is K1 here. What's interesting about K1 is that, so it, this is aligned, of course, Newgrange for the winter solstice. And one explanation I heard, and this is one case where I thought, hmm, there might be something in this, is, uh, you know, spiral patterns here. And the spiral patterns on this side are this way, one way, and the, if you like, they're, they're, they're clockwise, and the other side is anti-clockwise, right? With a dividing line between the two. Now, if you think of the motion of the sun uh, during the day, it rises in the east, sets in the west. And if you were a prehistoric man or woman looking at this, you'd see it rising in the east, setting in the west, and then it would rise again. But as it went towards the winter solstice, it would actually head uh, into a, it would be a smaller and smaller circle, right? Because it would be moving further and further south, okay? And so effectively, if you look at it from a flat earth point of view, you might think it's doing a spiral. Okay. But then at the solstice, it reverses. Okay, and the spiral would open up. So one explanation of the spiral patterns you see here is actually um, the, uh, the motion of the sun during the day and the reversal and this line dividing it. Now, you know, as I said, the problem is we uh, tend to uh, perhaps interpret stuff through to our own civilization all the time. And that might lead us up blind alleys, but it's 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 worth uh, it's worth uh, exploring further. That's fascinating. Um, I never knew that about the spiral, and it makes sense that that was a representation from what they could observe of the movement yes. of the sun, uh, without realizing that we're actually orbiting the sun. Because uh, yes. I suppose back in Neolithic times, we we can't presume that people knew that. No, <laughs> there's even some people are still disputed. <laughs> <laughs> we're not, we're not going to get into that. <laughs> um, brilliant. Okay, so we've got a few more questions. Um, so one is, so, okay, somebody is asking, why is today called the first day of winter when intuitively it's midwinter, given that it's the shortest day of the year? Uh, well, there's all these different definitions of when winter starts and when it ends. Um, the solstice... Um, the solstice, by the way, the word solstice means, well, obviously solace is uh, sun and stis means standing. So it's the point at which the sun stands. It's reached its most extreme. Uh, and similarly, you have uh, the summer solstice. But it is true that, um, you know, that winter is defined in different ways by different groups of people, including the meteorologist versus, uh, versus others. Uh, in fact, though, I mean, it generally gets colder. There's a time lag effect. I mean, if you, if you dip your toe into the, into the sea water, you'll realize September and October, it's quite warm. 
even in comparison yeah. with July and so forth. So there's a, a time lag effect of the atmosphere and of the sea and the earth. So in a sense, yeah, this being the beginning of winter, um, yeah, I'd, I'd almost agree with that. However, <laughs> the interesting thing about it, from a solstice perspective, I think the world is divided to, into those who from today now will start to talk about, well, the evenings are getting longer. It's a good stretch in the evening, you know, uh, as opposed to those after the summer solstice, the pessimist who will go on about the fact that, oh, it's getting darker every evening, you know, so. Even though it happens so gradually, you don't, well, personally, anyway, I find you don't notice a difference the next day. No, you won't notice it for, for a few weeks, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah so. I like to think in summer, for sure, I, I don't think about it. Well, it's also true in places like Newgrange that for a few days either side, you would, if you got in, you would exactly see the same show. Yeah, and that's and, actually something we mentioned. The live stream is actually going from Newgrange now, which is a, a wonderful silver lining to nobody being allowed in there at the moment, that they've mm -hmm. seen cameras and they've a live stream. It was happening this morning and yesterday. And they'll be live streaming again tomorrow morning um, because, like you say, it's it's so close to the winter solstice that it still lights up the chamber the same way. Yeah, and, he, and the, the solstice actually every four years, of course, the leap year effect drips into the twenty second. Okay. Very so uh, you know the lucky people are people who get in on the twenty second every four years, <laughs> not the twenty first. <laughs> Very good. Um, and on that similar topic, um, somebody here, Galaxy. Uh, is asking you mentioned that there's another site in Scotland that has a similar roof box and what is that place called please ah no I'm trying to remember it's in Orkney I'll have to uh, uh this just escapes my mind for the moment but it is up in Orkney and it has a similar roof box but it's actually aligned with the sunset instead of sunrise but it is not as good, I would use the word good carefully, as Newgrange because it is not as big a monument. It okay. has not got the really long 18 meter, meter passage, you know, because the trouble with sites like, um, you know, uh, well, not, it's not trouble with Newgrange, but, you know, people claim astronomical alignments, mm -hmm. but if it was, if it was pointed towards the winter, winter salts of sunset, instead of sunrise, somebody would claim it. If it was pointed at the equinoxes, somebody would claim it. If it was, you know, the, 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 the summer solstice, they'd claim it. So it's a bit like a roulette wheel. And, you know, the roulette ball could land on any of these locations. And so you have to, you have to see it with high precision to be really confident. Whereas okay. the new range, it is such a long passage in mm -hmm. and the alignment is perfect for when it was built back in mm -hmm. 5,100. That the chances of it just being a happy coincidence are minimal. Or zero, because it's also a three-dimensional problem. It's not even two-dimensional like the roulette wheel because they actually, the floor rises to the level of the roof box yeah. so yeah. that the light just touches or would have just touched the back. So all of those things together, you know, mean... It's not just going to happen by chance. It was not going to happen by chance. Okay, brilliant. So, yeah, we've, we've got Newgrange is something that we can be proud of, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, brilliant. Oh, a simple one here. Um, somebody was wondering, what is your background image, Tom? And is it a radio telescope? I think I can safely say, yes, it is a radio telescope. Yes, yes. So uh, it is um, the ALMA telescope, which is in the Atacama Desert. It's actually up, uh, I was there about two years ago. Uh, it's up uh, the Andes Mountains. It's actually at about 17,000 feet height. So uh, you move very, very slowly there. It's about the equivalent of Everest Base Camp. Right? Okay. And it is part of the European Southern Observatory, which Ireland joined. Um, and uh, so ALMA is a millimetre radio telescope, so a millimetre wave, rather like your microwave oven, um, but we're detecting microwaves from space using that. And ALMA, it's an acronym, right? It stands for... Millimetre. Atacama Large Millimetre Array. So okay, it's an so array... It's exactly what it like, is. Like LOFAR is, yes. Mm -hmm. So use the telescopes 
in the case of low fire across across Europe, and the same way here with the millimeter telescope to use it across the desert. Okay, perfect. And it's the ideal place for it being at that elevation. Just... Yeah, it's so dry. I mean, it's uh, you only have about one half of the oxygen that you normally have. That's why you move very slowly. <laughs> you occasionally, as I've done, climb up the stairs at the normal rate and then swear to yourself you're not going to do that again. <laughs> 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 and you actually have to wear an oxygen monitor which is uh, checking your oxygen uh, levels in your blood as well okay very good so yes we actually have somebody in the chat uh, nick in the chat who thinks that the roof box in scotland you're talking about is possibly called maze how maze how that's it i just could thank you thank you very <laughs> much I, I just couldn't remember the name for a moment yes Brilliant. Thank you for that. We, this is a brain trust here. <laughs> so we've got some questions on pulsars. So Joe on um, watching on YouTube is asking how rare are pulsars and how many would be in, for example, the Milky Way galaxy? And also, if these are timing signposts of our relative location, are there hundreds or thousands in our galaxy? Oh, there are thousands. We've already detected thousands in our galaxy. And this is also a question of uh, the size of our radio telescopes. If the radio telescopes were bigger and more sensitive, we'd detect even more. So there are certainly thousands of them. And uh, they could form a GPS system for the whole galaxy. So, you know, so if you're, we're star trekking in the future, we could use them as a, as a kind of neat reference to where exactly Sort of like galactical lighthouses, I suppose. Yeah, well, they're lighthouses, but, they, uh, but there's also uh, the timing difference between mm. them. The time shifts um, will actually be usable to, to locate where you are. But it's not only that, in fact, uh, there's an idea now when people are seriously trying it to uh, use them to detect gravitational waves. Or rather, it's a case of the Earth would be detecting the gravitational waves. So gravitational waves are um, were predicted by Einstein's theory of relativity. Uh, we have uh, we have detected them already a few years ago, so a whole new area of astronomy. But basically, if you imagine that the Earth, when a gravitational wave would pass it, it it's perturbed. It's actually moved with respect to the rest of the galaxy. So you could use the pulsars and the time shifts of the pulsars to see the motion of the Earth. Okay. Um, Right. So it's a way of using the Earth as a gravitational wave detector versus these uh, beacons in, this, in, in, in the galaxy. Oh, brilliant. So, yeah, definitely when we start exploring further afield, they'll come in very handy. They may, well, they may be even handy over the next few years as a way of <laughs> gravitational waves. Brilliant. Um, so you mentioned Einstein. We actually have a question relating to Einstein and time. Um, so as Einstein told us, this is coming from one of our YouTube viewers, um, time slows the faster one travels to the speed of light. Can you explain? So no, take it easy. Nice. To <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, uh, so I suppose the easiest way to think about this is supposing we were to travel to Alpha Centauri. This is the nearest star to the sun. And that is about four light years away. It would take us traveling at the speed of light, which of course we can't attain at the moment or anywhere near it. But if we could attain the speed near the speed of light, it would take us four years. That's what you and I would say for a rocket that left the Earth near the speed of light and then reaches Alpha Centauri. It would take four years. However, if you are on that rocket, right? Then, of course, you're moving near the speed of light and the distance, Einstein also said, the distance would also appear to be shorter. Okay. So that means, seen from the person on the rocket, right? They would get there in no time at all. So seen from our perspective, it took them four years. And looking at them, you would see they wouldn't have aged very much at all because they would have reached from their biological clocks 
Alpha Centauri in, in next to no time. So by traveling at the speed of light, you experience time differently. It's a time difference. Yes, it's always a time difference. And all it really is ultimately in the end is that light uh, is electromagnetic. We call it electromagnetic radiation. And the laws of physics are the same in every frame. And that turns out to have funny kind of effects. If the speed of light was the average speed of somebody in a, on a bicycle, we would intuitively understand all of this. It's mm. just that it is so big that we hardly notice the effect. But there are subtle effects, including, by the way, uh, going back to the GPS system that we use, that if we didn't have Einstein's theory of uh, general relativity, for example, um, all your mobile phones would be out by about 30 kilometers per day as regards the location, because they have to correct for all of these effects. Right, yeah, that's constantly moving and then the time- Constantly is moving, the, the satellites are moving quite quickly. Not anything like the speed of light, but enough mm -hmm. that it makes a difference. Yeah, and so it gets very complex, I suppose, it when does. you yeah. have to take into account all of these different things. Exactly. Um, okay, brilliant. So we have some people asking about um, radio telescopes. I think these are both about radio telescopes. So um, first of all, specific to our observatory here in Burr, Nofli, the ILOFAR telescope. And they're wondering why it was built here and how much was discovered there. And then we have another similar question. And what kinds of things can we detect with these telescopes? So, oh, okay, yes. Yeah. So... Um, LOFAR is actually a collection of telescopes. So we have one of these nodes, as it's called, of LOFAR in, um, in Ireland. And most of the time it works collectively with the other telescopes. So just like behind me are the pictures of uh, the ALMA telescopes, each one of those is one of those is equivalent to the telescope in Burr, the LOFAR telescope in Burr. And then we join them together to get a much deeper and a much more precise picture of the sky. So why, why Ireland? It turns out, believe it or not, that Ireland, or particularly the middle of Ireland, is the equivalent of the Andes. Right. from the point of view of radio waves. We're actually, there's not an awful lot of radio pollution in the middle of Ireland. And for that reason, then, we, we can detect the very faint signals that come from space. To give you an idea of how faint am I talking about, right, the, if you added up all the radio waves received since the 1940s in space, when people started to observe um, the night sky, and I exclude just exclude the sun, which is a very bright source, then the total amount of energy taken in all those years is the equivalent of a fly going two meters up a wall. That's how much it is. It is tiny, but our, our equipment is so sophisticated and the amplifiers are so good, we can actually detect these weak signals from space. And so the advantage of uh, Offaly is, in fact, it's a really, really good site. If your eyes could tune in to radio waves, you'd see a brilliant sky in Offaly. Absolutely brilliant. Of course, the clouds don't matter. Uh, we see through the clouds of radio waves. But if you go to other sites in the middle of Europe, there's a lot of interference from, uh, from digital audio broadcasts, from uh, a lot of other uh, electrical sources and so forth, and they are, they are a nuisance. It's the equivalent of light pollution. Yeah, it's like having a street lamps only yeah. at radio frequencies. So it's sort of okay. the telescopes to the weaker signals coming from space, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, so, and as... You were saying Ireland, the ILOFAR telescope here in Burr is just one node and the rest are spread all across Europe. That's yes, awesome. and we can use the telescopes individually um, and we can uh, point to different places in the sky, even with an individual telescope. 
and look at that area of the sky. The resolution isn't as good, but um, it's fine for, for example, for pulsars where you know exactly what the frequency of the pulsar is for long-term studies and so forth. Mm -hmm. So people are also wondering um, what other discoveries have been made. Now, I know the low-fire telescopes are used to study many different kinds of things, sometimes not necessarily discovering a new object, but understanding them in more detail. We have solar physicists who use it to study the sun. Um, we have people who use it to study different planets in our solar system. I don't know if you've any insight onto... Yeah, so, I mean, one of the... Uh, I mean, one of the things that LOFAR is very good at is detecting uh, very high-energy electrons that are um, produced in galaxies very far away. And so... If you look at uh, some of the pictures produced by LOFAR, you, Lo you see these beautiful galaxies that extend uh, for millions and millions of light years. And the energy um, is actually in the form of uh, electrons, which are producing the radio waves that we see. And so it's very good at picking up these, what we call non-thermal sources. They're very highly energetic um, sources. But it's also possible to look for um, planets around other stars with, uh, with low far. For example, um, in the case of our own sun, the, the solar wind comes from the sun and interacts with Jupiter, the planet Jupiter, and produces um, a radio aurora, rather like the aurora that we see in the night sky on the Earth. And the hope is that we will be able to do that also with LOFAR and detect these interactions because as I say, these telescopes are extremely sensitive. Brilliant, that would be amazing. So there's, yeah, there's many different things that LOFAR is being used for and other similar radio telescopes. Um, yeah, like you're saying all these, even detecting the magnetic fields around planets and things like that. So thank you. We've got some other questions here about pulsars. So, um, Anika is asking, how much more powerful would pulsar measurements of gravitational waves be compared to our current detectors? Ah, oh, well, very good question. But it's, you see, gravitational waves rather... So we have, of course, let me go back a little bit. So when you talk about the electromagnetic spectrum, we talk about radio waves, we talk about um, infrared waves, optical waves, ultraviolet, all the way up to gamma rays, right? So there's a whole spectrum there and a whole set of frequencies. And gamma rays are much, much higher frequencies than radio waves. In the same way, when uh, we look at uh, gravitational waves, there are some, there's a whole range of frequencies. And for electromagnetic radiation, we need totally different types of telescopes to detect that electromagnetic radiation. So we, for example, the telescopes behind me here are millimeter wave telescopes. Low fire looks totally different from them. And then if you look at a, an optical telescope, it's the more conventional like telescope. Again, totally different. Totally different again from a gamma ray telescope. So we need different types of gravitational wave detectors. And some are very sensitive, the very slow gravitational waves, like the one I was talking about using the Earth, and others are sensitive to quite fast waves, like the types that have been detected recently from the merging of uh, two um, neutron stars together. So it's to allow us to see a broader range of them, really. Better. Exactly, yeah. So there's no, no one, it's, it, it is the equivalent of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's a whole mm -hmm. new spectrum, but it's gravitational waves instead of the electromagnetic spectrum. And we, need, we will need a whole suite of telescopes. Yeah. To, it's to like are arguing if an optical or a radio telescope are better. They're, they're different. They're what? different and they give you a different perspective on the universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it allows us to see things in more layers and more detail. Yeah, so the stuff around, for example, so I talked about in the case of the gravitational waves we've detected are really fast phenomena, like two neutron stars or two black holes merging together. 
It's a very fast phenomenon, but there may well be very slow phenomena associated with big black holes like the one in the center of our galaxy. So in the center of our galaxy, we have a, a few times a million solar mass black hole right in the middle. Right. We know it's there because we've seen the motions of the stars around it. We've timed them. We know exactly how much material is in right in the center. And it's a million solar masses. And we've even detected the tiny changes in the light from the stars that's predicted by the general theory of relativity. That was, that was done only a year ago, uh, a year and a bit ago. And, and the guy who was awarded the Nobel Prize recently, Reinhard Genzel, uh, use the telescope that we've used as well called gravity and um, that's one of its principal um, uh, functions was to detect this black hole at the center of our galaxy so but there everything is much slower mm -hmm. and so we need a different type of uh, telescope and where the earth and its motion is much slower would be usable there okay very good so yeah different tools for different jobs exactly it? Great. Um, we have time for just one more question, which is perfect because we have another question from one of our Zoom viewers here. And, and this is harking back to, I mentioned some of the other things you were involved in at the start. So they're asking about the James Webb Space Telescope. And mm -hmm. is it still delayed? And also what involvement do we have here in Ireland in it? Okay, so uh, is it still delayed? It is now scheduled um, for launch summer of next uh, next year. Okay. okay. So it may end up in kind of October or so being launched. That's the sort of, but that's the sort of window we're looking at at the moment. So everything seems to be working fine. The, uh, the telescope has to be uh, shipped to Kourou, which is uh, in French Guyana. That's the European Space Agency launch site. So the telescope itself is mainly built by the US. But the, the rocket is an Ariane 5 rocket, which will be launched from Kourou. Kourou, by the way, in case uh, some people may not have heard of it, but they may have heard of Devil's Island. So Devil's Island is the island that features in the book uh, and the movie Papillon, where uh, and Dreyfus, the famous uh, Dreyfus case, he was there. Um, put onto this island and it's just opposite the launch site. So, you know, if you pay uh, the, the uh, boatman there a little bit of money, he'll take you onto the prison island and if you pay him a bit more, he'll take you back, you know, but uh, <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's, it's a fascinating site. So I hope to go there for the, for the actual launch. And the Irish involvement is we built some of the hardware, which is actually in the telescope itself. We built uh, beam splitters, so filters that divide up the light. And uh, we are now, haven't done all of that and haven't tested those and so forth. Uh, we're doing similar things for this aerial mission as well, but we're now actually are involved with the software with NASA um, developing the testing software um, for, for, for launch. So, one of the guys certainly out of the Institute for Advanced Studies will end up in the control room and checking everything is functioning in the right way and so forth um, next uh, the end of next year. So we are very actively involved in it. Oh yeah, and as a result of that, one great benefit of all of this, by the way, is because of our involvement, because we contributed hardware, we actually end up getting time on the telescope. Which is actually, very valuable. If you worked out how expensive the time is in terms of the total cost of the telescope. We are getting millions of dollars worth of time on the telescope as a result of our work over many years. So you can choose what you want to look at using- Exactly. I mean, within reason, you know, you don't- you, you, what will, Within yeah, reason. Within reason. But you can also do things that might not necessarily got past the committee, if you like. Okay, you don't have to make a case for the bits you want to observe. You, you're you just allowed yeah. observing time. You Or decide on something that's good you think for the community as a whole to get. Yeah. So that's a great benefit for Ireland and Irish researchers to have access. Yeah, well, it's the same with the European Southern Observatory. Mm. When we get involved with building equipment for the observatory, we get extra time uh, to use for our own uh, projects as well. Mm. 
So Ireland has a very active astrophysics research community then. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, hopefully over the over the coming years, it will grow further, particularly with the involvement with the European Southern Observatory, because some people might know it is building the, the largest telescope in the world. The ELTs is called. And so we'll have the opportunity. Uh, Irish business is the opportunity to bid for contracts. Yeah. And the astronomers have the opportunity to help with the instrumentation, sometimes with industry and then get time when the instrumentation is ready. Brilliant. Yeah. So lots of, I, I think, I suppose it's really uh, evident the, the way science research happens these days, specifically astrophysics and space science research, that it really is always international collaboration. People aren't able to do these things on their own. You have to work together. No, you have to work together. I mean, even any one country, um, you know, I mean, in the past, maybe Germany or somebody would build an instrument and it would be just a German instrument that would be built. But the cost of an instrument on the ELT is equivalent to the, a small space mission, right? And this is a ground-based instrument. So you need countries operating together, not only because of the cost. I mean, the cost is an obvious one, but another reason is the expertise. Yeah. So the expertise may be across the whole of Europe, even with, you know, 600 million people, mm -hmm. there's only a small number of people that have the knowledge of particular filters or whatever is needed to put it all together. Yeah. So we can achieve so much more together, really, than we ever could. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a wonderful opportunity for Ireland because um, you can play your part. It's not a case of, uh, you know, just because you couldn't build a whole instrument. No, but we could be very good at certain parts of it and, and, and concentrate on doing that. Okay, brilliant. So that's just another one of the many things you're involved in, Tom. Like I say, I couldn't list all of them. We That would have taken the full hour, I think. Uh, it's great fun, you know, and I, I have not lost my enthusiasm. I was interested in astronomy as a child. Um, I even uh, recall uh, my um, career teacher asking me what, what I wanted to do when I got older, you know, um, and I said, well, um, I probably like something in physics and you know and she said mm -hmm. yes she says uh, is that what you would like are you sure that's what you want to do I said to be honest I'd want to do something in astronomy and she said to me yes but what real job would you like <laughs> <laughs> so here I am I haven't no I'm not doing a real job I, said, but <laughs> I, I enjoy it <laughs> well, why be practical when you can do something interesting well, astronomy, I mean, uh, to give you an example, your mobile phone, uh, I talked about the fact that your GPS works as a result of Einstein's developments. But what other people don't know was uh, Wi-Fi that we all use now was developed by radio astronomers in Australia first. <laughs> that the camera in your phone was developed for astronomy, for the CCDs, for use yeah. in astronomy, and then of course it had lots of commercial uses. So, so lots of sort know, of knock-on, positive knock-ons from these developments. Absolutely, you know, I mean, you can't pigeonhole where things will go, because something that's of interest to astronomy turns out to be of interest to somebody else. Uh, for example, in medicine or whatever, it's 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 you know you cannot you cannot be blinkered in your approach. A good idea is a good idea that can come and often does from left field, not from where you expect. <laughs> and that's a brilliant note, I suppose, to end on because we have reached the end of our time. So I just want to say thank you so much to Tom for joining us and to Michael, of course, for allowing everybody to follow along with this discussion and talk. And I have to also thank uh, my colleagues in the background who have made sure all the tech side of things is running smoothly and our stream to YouTube and all those practical things. And also, um, so this is obviously being hosted by ILOFAR, which is an initiative of Trinity College Dublin and many other universities across Ireland as well. As we said, it's always a collaboration. And our um, engagement program is funded by SFI, Science Foundation Ireland, through their Discover program and also by Azero Ireland. So thank you to them for the support, without which we wouldn't be able to host interesting events like this. And of course, thank you to all the people who are attending this event. We wouldn't really have much of an event without you to talk to and to talk with and for all your wonderful questions. 
So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, happy winter solstice to everybody and winter break. I hope everybody manages to enjoy whatever they're up to. Happy solstice. <laughs> happy solstice, a start of winter, midwinter, whatever you'd like to call it. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. Bye.